welcome back for a brand new episode of The Witching Hour. I am Perry, and this is Haley. Hi. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm, as ever, just tickled that it's Friday. I know. I love Fridays. They're, well, I, I wouldn't say they're the best day. That's Saturday, but they're a good day. Saturdays are quite nice, too. This Saturday, for me, is going to be nice because I'm doing the riot junket. Which is like, like it's work. So like who wants to work on the weekend? But, you know, I'm talking about the new Disney animated movie, which I can't tell you how I feel about it, except that the social embargo lifted. So you can go and check out my positive tweet about the movie. Okay. <laughs> so there you have it. Fair enough. I'm excited. All right. We got a lot of stuff. It has been a week. Yeah. Like a lot of Paramount stuff. <laughs> Well, Paramount Plus had their big, like, unveiling day. Plus, it was TCA all week, so there was a lot of stuff coming out of that. Mm. It's been a busy week, and then there was that IGN Fan Fest. Ah, yes, yes. How are you feeling about this Paramount Plus stuff in general? Like, when it comes to the streaming wars and whether or not you're going to subscribe to something, where does this kind of rank on the list at this point? Well, I think that one of their announcements kind of changes things there with the movies. They announced major films like yeah. uh, Mission Impossible or let's say A Quiet Place Part 2 for the purposes of this podcast that they'll be landing on the streaming service 45 days after theatrical, which definitely like that's not a must subscribe in the way that HBO Max immediately became one. Mm-hmm. But it definitely there's an appealing factor there. Okay, just to catch everyone up on the newsy stuff, there was a lot. Well, yeah, that you can read about this on Collider. But just a little brief here: Paramount had announced that uh, moving forward, major tentpole movies will be streaming on Paramount 45 days after they hit theaters, while the studio will look at a 30-day window for non-tentpole movies after the pandemic is over over so as Haley pointed out with some of these that means mission impossible 7 top gun maverick a quiet place they're going to be streaming soon after they hit theaters if you have paramount plus the new streaming service is basically a rebranded cbs all access and it will launch in paramount plus form on march 4th so that's and they the announced basic like- of it a lot of new projects too. We're gonna talk about a couple in particular, but there's you know new Rugrats. There's uh, if you're into Yellowstone, boy, they got mm-hmm. Yellowstone coming. Uh, they have so much on their docket. Yeah, I mean, if uh, I feel it like just from the the movie fan perspective, they kind of made it like a non choice. <laughs> yeah. I, well, okay, so like two of the major things that were announced for our purposes were a new Pet Cemetery prequel, which has the the screenwriter from the last Pet Cemetery movie, Jeff Bueller, penning it, and a the the I believe it's the new Paranormal Activity with Christopher Landon writing the script will also be going direct to Paramount Plus. So in that way, it's like you're right; it's not really a choice. We're going to need to see those. Yeah. All right. Do you want to go down down the line here one by one with these? Sure. All right. The next one on on the list that you are kind enough to put together is Paramal Activity. So I I guess the only news out of that, though, is that it it is going to Paramount Plus. Yeah, I think that had all previously been. Because we we spoke about or did did we speak about it? Or did this launch? I think this new. I feel like this news might have dropped after we recorded Witching Hour, and I talked about it with Matt. <laughs> Entirely possible. We talk about Christopher Landon a lot. It's hard to keep track. We do. <laughs> but just in case we didn't, I'm a real fan of this team here. Because you also know how I feel about, uh, not necessarily underwater, but I am a big The Signal fan. Yeah. That was, uh, Eubanks' uh, previous movie. before. I underwater. really like Underwater, so we are both invested for different reasons. So we are, we're, we're even there, but I'm just, uh, I'm just curious to see what, what they wind up doing with that franchise. Like, I don't think we have any information regarding what's going to happen with the story, but it does feel like the kind of thing that needs to start fresh completely. I don't know. It's very, 
they have really like they took a fairly simple first film and spun it into a lot of mythology so uh, part of me is like i'm sure they're reluctant to release that mythology but at the same time how much can you mine after so many films um, i don't i don't think that the demon of this next movie can be toby <laughs> Right. Like, I definitely think you can run with a very similar concept or a similar style of filmmaking that's just updated to modern technology. But I think that particular lineage of demon needs to needs to go away. I think they I think they made it work pretty well for three films. It's like those three films I find so, so impressive as far as them taking this like seemingly super simple, no frills kind of concept and actually building on it with purpose from film to film. Yeah. Those three are so good. But I, I, I'm inclined to agree. It's time for probably a new direction or a new demon or something. We've just seen a lot of that. What do you think about the filming style? Like, are we the most, the most obvious path for this franchise to me feels like instead of you know, a, like a video camera at home on a tripod where, like, is it inevitable to have a multi-cam view where, you know, cell phones and, and like, almost like screen life where, like, cell phones right. and computers and all these other things are in play? I think that makes sense. I mean, I definitely think they're still going to go found footage because that's, like, that's the DNA, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but... I think that a cell phone makes a nice replacement for a video camera in today's age. Um, I screen life is almost, I, it makes sense, but I almost feel like you're losing a bit of the brand DNA if you fully mm -hmm. invest in a different type of format. It'll be ring cameras. Cause I'm trying to think of a, of a camera that with purpose sits statically and can have that, you know, fast paced uh, time going by kind of feel and then stopping on the, the bump in the night, which well, wouldn't really make much sense with a cell phone unless, you know, you, you positioned it a certain way. I've talked a lot about how I'm a fan of how three uses different camera angles to be super scary. So I, I would like to see a little bit more inventiveness in that way. I think how, what does uh, part three uses? Oh, oh, oh yeah different camera angles that's true that's true. more stationary but still very effective except for the rotating fan <laughs> right i love that shot there's a lot of good shots and that's a scary movie i mm -hmm. i i say it again that's a scary movie i think all three are quite scary that's the only one that does it for me but you know different strokes i also get nothing out of blair witch so i clearly oh. i should go with found footage sometimes it's pretty scary Blair, Blair Witch, I still find pretty unnerving, even though I've watched it dozens of times. <laughs> All right, so the next one here, Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery. Yeah. Yes, I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Feel it's like I. Do you think <laughs> like you're gonna dig into the mythology of the creature, or or maybe showcase a different person dealing with it? I mean, that's that's what I was wondering. So looking at this Dread Central article. Uh, Basically, the only information we have is that Paramount has confirmed that a prequel to Stephen King's Pet Cemetery is coming to Paramount+. Plus. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Bueller, who penned the recent remake, will write the script for the new origin story. And that is the extent of it. And I don't know. That's a good, that's a good question. I do think that this new movie is going to feel like a departure from the last remake. Like something about it is going to be drastically different because other than me, that movie was not received very well. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. But I mean, they are bringing back the screenwriter. So something about that clearly works for them. Um, I, I mean, maybe, maybe what they're going to do is lean into the mythology in a sense. It's, it's like, you know, how um, one of the most eye catching elements of the trailer was the the group of kids in their masks and then that barely factored into the movie maybe they'll lean more in that direction where like you thought there was more mythology in that kind of area and they're just going to build out something that that touches on mythology in that sense if you know what i mean i could see that i would certainly prefer that to like here's 
and how the Wendigo happened. Like that's right. not really, that, that creature can't really be explained appropriately or you kind of lose the whole mythological feel of it. Um, Judd lived in that house all his life, right? Or most of it? Maybe it's a, a young Judd story. That's interesting. We kind of already know his story, though. I know. As I said that, I was kind of thinking about it. I don't know, there's definitely room to play there. I'm just always wary of, like, you know, the here's your prequel where we explain the, the evil presence in full detail and take everything away that made them mysterious and cool. Yeah, that does seem like the easy answer on this one. It's going to be how how did the ground come to have that ability? Yeah, I'm, I'm iffy on that. But, you know, I'm reluctant to judge anything until I see it, even if that makes me bristle on, uh, on principle a little bit. Yeah. And, you I know, I, who am I to talk? I like Prometheus and Covenant, and that's exactly what they do, is, like, demystify the xenomorph. Yeah, and those are the parts of those those movies that I don't love. <laughs> Yeah. Look, I have qualms, but I still love them. They're beautiful and they're epic sci-fi. I like the parts of both movies that feel like the type of horror that Alien was. Sure. That that's when I kind of perk up while watching them. But when it gets into the you know the uh, the fast bender of it all, that's that's where I check out. I like both. I just think they belong in different films. <laughs> like Oops, no. it specifically feels like two different movies sandwiched. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think I might have been able to appreciate that other part of the movie that I didn't like so much in the Covenant package, if maybe they had explored those ideas in two different movies. Yeah, that's fair. All right. So we've got Paranormal Activity, Pet Cemetery. They also, I, gosh, I should have taken down more of the titles and the notes, but those were the major horror ones. Um, aside from the, you know, the reveal that A Quiet Place probably oh, yeah. will be available pretty quickly. Um, what do you think of that window? Because, you know, we had the whole uproar with uh, HBO Max releasing their slate the way that they did, which, you know, it's extreme. I mean, we're about to get something like Godzilla versus Kong in theaters and at home at the same time. It's a completely different kind of situation. But then you had Universal hit somewhat of a middle ground. I forget what their window was. Was it was it 17 days maybe? Did I just make that number up? It's in remember. that ballpark. But I mean, are, are theater chains going to be more OK with this than they are the other arrangements? I would imagine so. That's a pretty long window, honestly, and it, it falls fairly in line with what you would expect for a regular, like, um, VOD release. Anyway, mm -hmm. it, I guess maybe those can be a bit longer for the big temples, but it's not. It's not short. Like that's a solid amount of time for all the people who rush to see those movies in the first place to get in there. So maybe the better question is, who do you think wins? The studios that play ball with the theaters in that respect or the ones that, you know, just give the theaters a big old middle finger and say, we don't need you anymore. Or or rather, not necessarily we don't need you anymore, but we make the rules now. That is, I think, the question everyone in the industry wishes they knew the answer to. Yeah. Um. It's an impossible predicament right now, and I don't begrudge Warner Brothers doing what they did. I understand why theater owners do, but they have to sustain their business as well. Well, there's there's ways to sustain your business and maybe green light the plan that you want, but while informing the other individuals involved yeah. in those projects before you actually make the announcement because I can tell you it probably is not a good feeling to learn big information like that about something you work super hard on through a like a press release or a variety report versus hearing it beforehand of course but that's uh that's more of a like issue with corporate corporate culture type thing um I agree but I also don't think the people signing the checks necessarily can. yeah I mean, it is interesting that we've got all, all these uh, all these streaming services playing a completely different kind of game right now because they've got these three that we just mentioned have the varying uh, the varying release windows, and then you've got Disney, which is I, are they the only ones releasing new releases on their streaming service and applying a premium to it? 
I think so for now. Yeah, it's all very, I mean, I think in five years, someone's going to have a really cool book to write about how this changed the industry. I will read that book. Yeah. If you had a pick, like if you were the head of a studio and you had to pick one of these plans to enact right now to best serve your company in the future, which would you pick? And then in five years, we'll revisit this and whoever picked the right answer wins. I'm the person signing the checks and I want to make money. Yeah. Warner Brothers. I feel like I'm cheating by saying Disney just because they have so much, but I don't know. I mean, you know, you know me. I'd be the I'd be the one who would feel bad and play the Paramount card and probably lose out because of it. Where I would do something that would make the most the most uh, entities happy, and it wouldn't be good for me. Right. Well, that's not the question you asked. You no, know, I know. It's just the ethical choice. Um, I do think you know. HBO Max was a maybe, and now it's a must. And that was, for their purposes, a very smart business decision. Yeah. I mean, really, I think they're all musts at this point. <laughs> if you want to keep up with everything, at least. I know. One of these days, we're going to have to have, like, a cable package or something. I don't know. It's like, before, when it was just CBS All Access, that was a trimmable one to me. Oh, yeah. Because... I just, I, I have no need to pay attention to those series, except the brief times that I'm watching something like Star Trek Discovery, which I've fallen behind on anyway. Yeah, that was the easy cut for me before, definitely. But I, I think that I will have to have a Paramount Plus, because it's not, you know, that 45-day window is long enough that it doesn't make it a must, but mm -hmm. the original releases seem like they will. They really came out of the gate strong with their announcements. There was a little bit of something for everybody. Meanwhile, I think I read a I read a headline. I shouldn't say this without actually having the information on hand that, uh, you know, uh, like stock market wise, Paramount received like a middling grade with its announcement. That's interesting. I, I think, I, well, it. uh, I don't you know, the stock market is not indicative of anything other than human psychology, really. But there's so much fatigue around streaming, I feel like. There's too many now, so I wouldn't be surprised if people saw that and went like, yeah, so. Until the actual product is in front of them and people are talking about something they want to watch, it's just another streaming service. That's fair. Just for, uh, for a little background information, one of the first articles that came up when I searched was this deadline article with the headline, Viacom CBS Vision for Paramount Plus, wows some analyst, but 5% stock drop suggests Wall Street verdict still out. So somewhere, somewhere in the middle on it over in Moneyland. All right. Well, do we, it's not ruthless enough. Do we want to move out of uh, Paramount Plus territory and into oh, uh, Netflix? I think we better unless we want to be here all day. Yeah, I also think uh, I just by saying that, I don't know, you organize this pretty well. Never mind. We've got three Netflix stories in a row. I shouldn't have doubted. All right. <laughs> this first one, Spike Lee producing a Cthulhu horror movie for Netflix, which will likely have more than five bloods. <laughs> That's a Greg original. I love Greg. Yes. <laughs> this makes me very happy. This is, this is totally your jam. I feel like you get the floor on this first. Okay. Well, first, though, read the plot details because they're oh, really wow. interesting. Okay. Okay. All right, going, scrolling down, scrolling down. The film from an original screenplay by Hank Woon with rewrites by See You Yesterday co-writer Frederica Bailey follows Gordon Hemingway, a Black American adventure hero who teams up with a fearsome Ethiopian princess to rescue her regent from a mystical ancient evil force. I think that's it, yeah. Because then, then I think... Greg is uh, commenting on uh, the ampersand in the title, <laughs> yes, which it, which is Gordon Hemingway and the Realm of Cthulhu, with the N being an ampersand. I mean, that's a very cool log line. Mm -hmm. In addition to just me being obsessed with Spike Lee, me being obsessed with Lovecraftian horror, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, I also love I love the idea of. Um, Spike Lee making something Indiana Jones esque. Yeah, I feel. I feel like. Uh, I feel like his style of filmmaking could 
tap in tap into what we know and love about films like that, but also be something totally different and only Spike Lee. Yeah, I mean, he's just producing. I think it's the director of See You Yesterday. But I, yeah. I absolutely hope that Spike Lee quality translates. It is the director of See You Yesterday. But Which still, like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, as much as I like Spike Lee stuff, obviously, that's a very high bar to clear. But I did like that film. I have not seen See You Yesterday. It's solid. Little, um, little- I remember when it came out. And then I just, I, I don't know why I didn't cover it. Ooh, it's got um, Marsha Stephanie Blake in it, too. There's a lot to like yeah, about that. List. My only, like, hang-up here is knowing that Netflix has a somewhat unreliable quality in their films, let's say. And so I, I'm i always reluctant to get, like, too out of my head hyped up because you never know what's going to be, like, Project Power-ish, let's say, as opposed to... No, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, the one thing now that I have a clearer sense of who's involved and how is um, the director of See You Yesterday might benefit from the fact that that movie was made for mm-hmm. for a Netflix release and having that experience under his belt could serve this one well. And, you know, I, I don't know the capacity with which Spike Lee gets involved creatively as, as his uh, producing work goes, but I, I would imagine that would be a very positive force to have behind his back. I'm just trying to look up some other stuff that Spike's only produced lately. And it's also like Spike Lee's got the, the, the five bloods experience now too. It's like, I, I don't know. I feel like if they, if they enlist in talent like them that have already done their thing at Netflix, it's to trust their, their vision. Whereas when I think about some of the mistakes made over at Netflix, as far as original films go, and you know, this is just me theorizing too. There's absolutely no reason to think any of this is fact, except a feeling I have, but it, it's almost, uh, it's almost impossible not to connect those kinds of concerns about a quality of a movie with, oh, there are too many cooks in the kitchen. Like someone swooped in and said, meanwhile, now that I'm saying that almost every conversation I've had about a Netflix movie is about how supportive the higher ups at Netflix are. So I know I've always heard the same thing too, which is (laughs) curious. I've I've just circled back to accomplishing nothing. (laughs) Sorry guys. (laughs) <laughs> but Spike Lee is like not just the five bloods. He uh he did his She's Gotta Have It series yeah. with Netflix. Like he clearly knows how to work with them. And I I'm 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 feeling more optimistic about this one. Oh shit, he produced you yesterday. He did. I did not know that either. Mm-hmm. All right. So he's you know, he's experienced with them and I like all of what they've done together so far. Okay. Well, now now watching See You Yesterday is an even higher priority. It's, I don't want to like over. It's not like the best movie you're all ever see, but it's super solid. Well, I feel I feel like you saying it's super solid. Me wanting to prep for this release that I'm excited about, and the fact that like I vividly remember when it was being promoted, I wanted to watch it, and then didn't watch it because I wasn't assigned the junket. <laughs> well, Netflix has a million contents every week. Every week. It's especially not fair when it's a week where I want to watch all of it. And that's something that makes, like, in terms of what we were just sc- discussing with the HBO yeah. Max move, it's very hard to compete with Netflix, and they found a way to do it. Just like Disney did with by bringing Star Wars and the MCU to their service, they found a way to compete. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm just, like, I'm looking at this list now, and... It's just it, like it's impossible to watch everything. I don't know. I feel like I spent so much of my life saying that I've been able to see the large majority of, of like the big new films. And now like I I can't get my head above water ever. It's not possible. And the chances of ever doing so like dwindle with every new streaming service announcement. It's just not going to happen. But I guess that's a good thing because that's more opportunities. There's more diversity in story and more jobs out there. So, yay. All right, the next one? Yes. Alexander Aja. What do we got here? Some new images. Uh, yes, and some some quotes. If you guys couldn't tell, I was scrambling to get ready for this podcast today, and Haley was kind enough to put together today's news list. Oh, and it, 
it's, uh, you know, it was really easy this week. I didn't have to dig. <laughs> All right. So for this one, we've got Alexander Aja's new Netflix thriller, Oxygen, revealed in exclusive images. I knew, I knew we had this exclusive. Um, let's see what this one is about. Aja is directing this one himself, and he told our own Steve Weintraub, I was in it all the way. I pictured myself waking up locked in this uh, cryo unit trying to figure out who put me there and why. Oh, have I skipped the... No, that's at the top of the story. Wait, what is this movie about? The... Uh, oh, I see. I see what he was doing here. Mm -hmm. Um... And if you want to, f all right, so the quote is actually important. I was in it all the way. I pictured myself waking up locked in this cryo unit, trying to figure out who put me there and why. I felt her desperation. And if you want to feel her desperation, you'll get a thrill from these exclusive images below. And then it goes on to explain the her trapped in the device, which you could see in the images on Collider.com, is Melanie Laurent from Inglorious Bastards, whose character lives in a near future where breathable air is hard to come by and must claw her way, Haley, this sounds like it's gonna stress you out, and must claw her way out of this situation with her life intact. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's stuck in a cryo unit. Are you gonna be okay? <laughs> huh. uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, my claustrophobia isn't actually one of my big things. Maybe like emotional claustrophobia. Okay. Oh no, that's. I'm trying to think of like the the movies where I've sat next to you and you've been mighty stressed. Yeah. I feel like the one that sticks in my mind most of all is Unsane. Yeah, and that's more emotional terror. Uh, but yeah, I think I'll be. Uh, I'm good. Like I've seen Buried. That was fine. Um, he gives. He talks about Buried and says like that was one of those movies where you're like I didn't think of that but he teases that this has more of a post-apocalyptic edge which sounds okay. interesting sure it has to do with the air being gone huh. um but that's this the kind of movie that i love to see people making amidst the pandemic where they have to reinvent you know this was he mentions was easier to get done right now safely because it's a limited cast um and i it's that whole you know, necessity is the mother of invention thing where sometimes you get your best work because you had to change your plans. Um, I'm, I'm super into this. I love a contained thriller. And after what he did with Crawl, this has mm -hmm. to me the sound of a similar trapped with a bunch of different variables that escalate the situation every new scene type movie. These, these images look great too, because one of the things you always worry about with a concept like this is that the visuals will grow old and stale. And I mean, he gave us one, two, three, four images here that all have really distinct feels to them while obviously still feeling like she's stuck in that cryo chamber. But I don't know, it's, I think it's a, like it's a real art and a near impossible challenge to deliver a movie that makes you feel confined while also not feeling like, like too small that it ruins the, like the cinematic nature of the story. And if I were to judge based on images alone, it feels like he's got the eye to pull this off. I, I'm, I will be honest, I wasn't super aware of this until we debuted the images, but I'm immediately on board. And she's great. She's always great. Like if anybody can command a movie like this, it's Melanie Laurent. Oh yeah. No, I can't wait to see her movie too. Which one's oh, she's, she's She's uh, directing one with um, Ellen Dakota Fanning. I forget oh, the nice. I forget the title off the top of my head, but it's a like it's a, a title that we've heard before, like for another movie that has nothing to do with her movie, but they're called the same thing. I will get you that title in one second. Oh, the Nightingale. That's what it was. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was even really recent. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So she's got that coming up as well. She's gonna have a assuming that is coming out in 2021. I actually, now that I'm saying it, I think it just had a release date delay but I don't know if it was just to later 2021 or like a completely different year. But anyway, that's coming out for her soon too. Well, good for her. I'm, I look forward to both, even though I will be side-eyeing like the Nightingale just came out. Guys. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that, that that title is used for a good reason. Yes. All right. Last thing on our Netflix list is Army of the Dead. How did oh, yeah. you like that trailer? 
all right, here's the thing. I'm hyped as hell for this movie. Like, I think that the log line is so good. I love the Dawn of the Dead remake. A uh, lot of that visual energy going on in this tease. I'm fully on board. I like. I think this sounds like it's going to rule. I am 100% on board. I... Uh... Man, I, I think his Dawn of the Dead remake is my favorite of all of Zack Snyder's movies. It's the one that I watched the most. And I like I watched that movie nonstop. And not just because there were zombies, but there are certain images in this trailer that bring me right back to oh, that yeah. movie. And it really excites me. The only thing that I'm kind of hung up on is, and I think someone might have brought up this question in Slack and like planted it in my brain, but like, why do people need to rob a bank during a zombie apocalypse? Like, what are you going to do with the money? I'm sure that's going to be justified. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I I'm not. I, that's such an easy write around. It doesn't bother me at all. It's like the, this society still uses money. Boom. Handled. Uh, because maybe it's not at the beginning, which it oh. looks like from the trailer. So which is totally like, fair. It's, yeah. it's totally fair. I can't stop thinking about it, though, to the point that I wish they included, like, some little detail as to why in the trailer so I could stop thinking about it. But, like, I do love what I'm seeing otherwise. Yeah, and the other thing is, like, human beings love money so much. It's not a hard stretch for me to believe that as soon as society starts to rebuild, that'll become a primary focus again. Okay. I know. I, I will... I mean, even that, I think, is, like, an interesting idea that we never... We don't really explore in any zombie movies or TV shows I can think of off the top of my head, like basically planning for the world to get back to normal and the idea of hoarding all of these, you know, top priority items that people might not value in the moment. But when the time comes, you're going to need them again. That's interesting. Yeah. And there's also I saw somewhere and I wish I could remember, but there were stories earlier this month that like there's a area 50 maybe tying in there. So there could be an <laughs> alien situation happening too. That I don't feel like is confirmed, but it was going around and that's very intriguing. The whole thing is very intriguing to me. I'm fully on board. I can't wait. And um, in that really good vanity, it was vanity fair, right? Yes. Yeah. That big piece on uh, justice league, which is a whole situation uh, and beautifully written, but that photograph of Tig Notaro oh. from the set of Army of the Dead. I was like, this is, that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> I did see that image. Big old thumbs up. Oh, so good. Yeah, I, I'm super hyped for this one. I think the the trailer did, it's like, okay, so it's not that the trailer didn't do enough, because I just I still don't really know what it's fully about. It feels like more of a teaser. Is I guess what I'm oh, trying. Yeah, to yeah, that's yeah. that's definitely what I'm assuming with this one. Yeah, but like all that, the imagery was exactly right for me. Yeah, that wasn't a story trailer at all. It's like I wouldn't even be surprised if I got the answer to my question in the next trailer in a full right. trailer. That I was more that. just a, a little overview. I guess what I was really poorly trying to say is like, <clears throat> I don't want to get ahead of myself because that trailer was so thin, but I am fully hyped. I mean, maybe, maybe that trailer is thin, but you already have the foundation of Dawn of the Dead and some of other uh, work from Zack Snyder. It's like that, that is kind of all you need to set your expectations reasonably. That's true. And Dawn of the Dead, for me, when it came out, was so formative in helping me become the horror fan yes. that I am today. It's like, I'm, yeah, I was always going to be a sucker for this. I saw his Dawn of the Dead before I saw any of the Romero movies. Oh, nice. So it was very formative. Uh, yeah, that was a big, I probably started just experiencing all of it at the same time because, you know, zombies became such a thing again after... Mm -hmm. 28 Days Later, Resident Evil, Dawn of the Dead moment. And at the same time, my high school group of friends was exploring all the old horror classics. So it's all just tangled up in this big bunch of love for zombies. Shit, your high school group of friends was way cooler than mine. <laughs> no, no, we were theaters. We there's nothing cool. 
I had I had one friend when I was, you know, more so in elementary school and middle school. And that was always the friend that when we were hanging out, I would know that we were going to be watching a horror movie that wasn't appropriate for kids our age. So I have heard a thank for movies like like Poltergeist, Silence of the Lambs, a lot of that kind of stuff where I was probably single digits and watching it. And then, and then as I got older, like in high school, it was more of, it was more of just like the cool thing to do on a Friday night was to see the big new horror release, whether it was um, like Dawn of the Dead or shit. Now I'm like going back to middle school a little, but like, I remember like big events being like Dawn of the Dead, the Texas Chainsaw remakes. Uh, I know what you did last summer. Like I vividly remember it being like an event to get in my mom's car because of course my mom was the only one who would take us and we'd go see these movies. Probably this is just standing out in my mind because of how traumatic it was, but the Hills Have Eyes remake was a big event that I remember specifically. <laughs> we still watch that movie in this house all the time. I love that movie, but I also like was not prepared at that age to <laughs> behold all of that. It is. I, it's brutal. That's a, a brutal, nasty movie. I don't know that there is any age to be prepared to behold all of that. I don't think I can think like I feel like I went into like a little bit of a dead zone as a kid where things stopped affecting me. <laughs> it's like when I was a teeny tiny child, I thought, you know, I thought shit like Killer Clowns from Outer Space was scary because I didn't realize it was a horror comedy. But but after that, it was like not like nothing affected me whatsoever until I became an adult. And I realized that some things in horror movies are truly things to be afraid of. And then I started to be afraid of them again. But there's this big gap where nothing happened. I don't know. I just realized also I wasn't that young when I saw the Hills Have Eyes. I was a little later. Um, and I de like I was fully at an age to be disturbed by what I was seeing. Maybe my maybe my, like my teens and early 20s was like an invincibility phase. <laughs> just like thought it was only in the movies and it couldn't affect me in real life. It tracks with teenage brain. Yeah, I guess so. All right, we got one more story to hit, but it's taking us from Netflix to Shudder, but it's keeping us within the uh, the franchise here, or at least some of the franchise we were talking about with Dawn of the Dead, because this one is George Romero's lost movie, The Amusement Park, to stream for the first time ever this summer, and I believe it is on Shudder, right? Did I see Shudder? Uh, yeah, yeah, Shudder. Yeah. Sorry, I was, I was totally still an army of the dead. I'm not going to uh, lie. <laughs> understandable. Okay. I have one more question about yeah. that. Do you think he's going to do anything weird like the zombie birth scene? I don't know. I'm like, I'm... It's just because... It's because... When it came to Dawn, when it came to Dawn of the Dead, it was very much more in line with like the classic zombie outbreak, and we're gonna hole up in this thing. But this feels feels like the the heist element of it and the Vegas element of it are are like the key things. And I feel like if you're so focused on that within a zombie apocalypse, you can't focus on doing something offbeat like that. I hope so because that's the one part that doesn't work for me in that movie. Yeah. A little too silly. Yeah. And maybe there is a way to make that work, but it just didn't quite track. And the little zombie babies are, I think, funnier than they wanted it to be. Yeah. Isn't it, like, rubbery looking? It's real funny. You know what's really weird? This is such a, like, a tangent here. But someone recently posted on Twitter, like, go in your phone and go in your pictures app and search the word movie and tweet oh. the first image that comes out. Here, wait, I'll, I'll legit show you what my what my picture is and it's like why the fuck is this on my phone oh i'm curious no oh, it's it's weird all right so i'm searching the word movie Cute. oh no what's it gonna be <laughs> i didn't see it coming what is that from so this is the prop baby from the i had you know what i had to do is i had to send i had to put this image on my computer and i had to google image search it to figure out what it was it's the prop baby from the movie adaptation of the giver oh my god i don't know why i would have saved that image on my phone <laughs> like maybe i did it as a joke and I sent it to someone that i was gonna buy it or something i don't know that's so 
fabulously specific and random. I actually am <laughs> distraught to report that nothing comes up for me. Really? I got nothing. Yeah. I think the only other things that came up for me were, were photos that were taken in the arc light. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Maybe like location settings automatically did it too, but. That, that one's the winner. Um, <laughs> we should have like a ranking of the goofiest and or creepiest TV baby or movie babies with the Twilight baby. Or I was just, wa I was rewatching that the birthing scene from Twilight because my mom had it on the other day and just like, what, like, what was that? That's just, I, I mean, maybe supernatural births have not been figured out yet on screen. Hey, <sighs> man. <laughs> <laughs> still can't believe what that looked like um all right do we want to move into romero now yes i think i've i <laughs> i honestly as soon as you started talking about it i remembered the baby and i was just like far away <laughs> <laughs> i think it's a totally reasonable thing to have happened <laughs> all right so amusement park is going to be on shutter and just for a little context here, how about a quote from Craig Engler, Shuttle's Ge Shutter's general manager. The moment we heard that amusement park had been rediscovered and was being restored, we knew we had to bring this unseen George A. Romero masterpiece to Shutter members. And you know, that's that's why I love them. They're so they're so good at curating their library. So this movie was actually completed in 1975, and it follows an elderly man growing increasingly disoriented and detached from reality as his troubles with growing old in the United States take shape around him in the form of roller coasters and chaotic crowds. Now, that log line sounds just absolutely not so in the best possible way. Like I can't even, I can't even imagine what that looks like. I'm so excited. I, I mean, obviously you're going to be excited for the chance to see a Romero movie. You haven't had the chance to see before. Yeah. But I honestly didn't know much about this. And that log line is excellent. That is an era where he was really firing on all cylinders, really excellent at merging, you know, social themes with his horror as is his brand. But I just, I, oh, I'm so excited. And a uh, shout out to Yellow Veil Pictures, too, who I think helped put this together and is also a fantastic team. Yes, a lot of good people involved in this one. And again, not a Shutter ad because it never is, but I love Shutter. I can always count on them to give me a little of everything. Yeah. And this is, I think, really something that makes them so special is like they're not just giving you a place to watch all your old favorites. They're not just finding really cool new indie movies. They're not just pulling things like La Llorona, which by the way, I think hits VOD on the 2nd of March. I did want to flag that. It's amazing. You should watch it. Um, but they're also doing restoration work and mm -hmm. creating original shows and documentary. It's just, again, not an ad, but I'm a big fan. It's even like what they just did with, uh, what was it, Deadly Games, where they kind of like dug that up out of nowhere and like, we can watch it because they did that. It's just such a resource for horror fanatics. And I am, I am grateful. As am I. All right. That brings us to our last topic. And I feel like everybody at this point should know what it is. Can you guess? This is your one and only WandaVision spoiler warning. Putting up that spoiler flag right now. And we are going deep into WandaVision episode eight spoilers. So go watch, pause the video, go watch the episode, come back and press play and it'll continue right here. Mm -hmm. Now that that's done, did you like it? Mm -hmm. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. After being a little bit disappointed last week, like this, this is what I need, but also I, I don't think I even knew what I needed and I wasn't anticipating this whatsoever. I mean, it's a, it's a complete style shift again and it feels like something that drastically different shouldn't work, but it does. And I'm just, this often happens with me in TV series when we get a, you know, a standalone episode that of course, you know, 
this what we learn in this episode has great value for what's going on in WandaVision and also beyond it, but it also almost operates like its own little standalone episode, like a little uh, a character piece on Wanda. And I think they're so successful in that. And Elizabeth Olsen, she just absolutely crushes every single sequence in this. She's quite something, that one. I, I, I really really like this episode and I think it ties into something that I've been discussing that's been irking me a little bit is a lack of balance in your storytelling and because this episode sits still and focuses in and you know commits to unfolding one story I think Mm -hmm. it's so much more successful I do like if I my critic hat is on I kind of think that the balance is still off in the sense that they waited so long for any answers. They have to spend a lot of this doing exposition, which I wish wasn't quite so heavy on that front. But I I think this is one of my favorite episodes so far. I think it's one of my favorite favorites also. And what I will say about the exposition is like, yeah, it is kind of heavy on exposition, but it really excites me that they did that because I want my I want my mom to enjoy this episode just as much as I did. And it, it, it's not it's not like having heavy exposition like that ruined my fun at all. I still was able to to love it. And I think uh, I don't know. I I think the exposition was delivered naturally enough. But that's going to be key to her experience and key to her feeling what Wanda's going through right now and giving value to whatever happens in next week's episode. So I am kind of glad that they included that stuff for that reason. Yes and no. I think it's a both. Like, I think there's a way to keep your newer audiences up to speed. Again, maybe it goes back to the balance of how you distribute, distribute your information. But had we not had to guess everything for seven episodes. There might not had to have been so much telling, telling, telling in this one. And that's putting my critic hat for an episode I otherwise genuinely liked and found very moving. Yeah, it was. It was uh, like it made me far more sensitive than I was ready for. It just oh, definitely- that, that vision line, what is grief but the perseverance of love? Mm-hmm. Beautiful. You guys know I just um, helped program that film festival and we did put a movie in about grief in there. And some of my fellow programmers were like, I'm not sure this is about love. It's more about grief. And I kept trying to explain why grief is love. And I did not do anywhere near as good a job as that one <laughs> line does. <laughs> Oy, that uh, I feel like if you're second to that, that's still not that bad. <laughs> So it's a damn no, good it's a dialogue. Delivered. Beautifully delivered. Gosh, Paul Bettany. I mean, it really is Elizabeth Olsen's show, especially in this episode, but he's so good. Yeah, I mean, I know we get, it, it could feel hyperbolic to start, uh, you know, chanting Emmy, but. I it's fair. I mean, and I, I know the, uh, you know, I don't I don't think uh, hardcore Marvel fans feel this way and I don't think anyone should feel this way anymore. But I still think even with, you know, Academy Award nominations and all these achievements that the brand has had over the years, I still think there is that that general idea that, you know, superhero movies are less than. And I feel like this is a perfect example of an artist working her craft to the max and making it so much more that like like that that line that idea is just is just trash and she almost single-handedly through her performance in this is essentially proving that absolutely I, it's one of the like all right the year is early so what does this even mean to say one of the best performances of the year blah 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 but it's gonna be at the end of the year I too we all know it i i i feel fully comfortable saying that about her work here should but what's there to I mean come on come on so where where does this episode bring you in theory land what are what are some of like the big the big changes or maybe the big reinforcements there well I got one more thing right that I'm very proud of <laughs> I've especially gotten two things right this season remind me what it is we've theorized about so many things <laughs> I know so last week's was I got it right that she did kill the dog Okay. Uh, this week's, as I was right, that the footage was a lie. Wanda did not go there to steal the body. They were. Missing. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. No, that uh, that that scene, that scene, something else too. <laughs> That's rough. That's like, like even though, 
like vision isn't a human per se like that's fucking body horror yeah it really was for some reason the shot of the legs really got me specifically oh. It was just like the the ripping apart of things that felt felt like shockingly organic to me. Like I wasn't I just wasn't ready for it to feel that way. It was pretty yeah, it was rough. I again, the performances happening are just tremendous and I don't want to just harp on that over and over again, but that scene for all the body horror of it doesn't work without her reactions being yeah. perfect and not over the top and just heartbreaking. Without a doubt. Is there any disappointment regarding Evan Peters? I've been on the, I don't think he's really Quicksilver train for a while. I would like a little more understanding of what the fuck that is happening there. <laughs> but no, I, I've already been there for a minute. Yeah. I don't know. Part of me still is on the fence about it, but it's, it, it's not a critical assessment of, of the show itself. It's, it's my feelings of, it's my feelings as a superhero movie fan, which it, it doesn't feel fair to put those kinds of pressures on the show itself. Cause I think what they're, what they did with him in the show worked well enough. I mean, then again, they obviously did that to, to be like wink, wink, or like, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of feeling. So maybe I can judge them for manipulating uh, emotions and expectations in that respect, only to pull the rug out from under you and be like, ha ha, not so fast. So I don't know. Maybe my frustration in that sense is still valid, but I also st still think that it works given Agatha's agenda. Yeah. I really, really like what they're doing with Agatha. And I think that maybe I, I now think that we were wrong in the idea that there's some bigger villain below this. Yeah. Which thrills me, honestly. I'm so happy to be wrong in this. If that is how it happens, I love the, the idea that there was just a super powerful witch who felt a magic she couldn't understand and was drawn to it and has just been hijinxing this whole time. Yeah. And they, you know, it's a, it's a very, uh, like a, a human quality and theme there to, to have that, you know, maybe not to that extent, it's not justifiable, but uh, to have that kind of reaction to something you can't understand and like you're reaching for and you can't get it and just the, the pressures you could put on others in order to get you the answers. But like there's, at this point, I definitely don't think that there's like a big or bad operating, but if there is, like, no, <laughs> like do not do that with one episode left. This would yeah. have been the time to reveal. Like, now, now that option is is out the window. It's not possible. Unless I go to the article that you sent me about Loki. That, <laughs> see, that's, that's a different kind of thing. If it's some sort of, you know, ending nod to other Marvel stories, I think they can get away with that. But this has to be a story of... Agatha being the big bad and them seeing it through to fruition in episode nine and then, you know, doing their typical Marvel thing where they, you know, carve a little path to another project. But there can't be someone above Ag Agatha at this point. I don't even, we'll see, but I don't even know if it's going to ultimately play out that Agatha is the big bad. I think she actually might end up being something of an ally uh, now that she understands that she is the Scarlet Witch, this figure she didn't even believe existed. Well, I would like to see that, I think. I can't know if I would like to see it. For it. Oh, so like something like that's happened in the comics? Sort of, um, but in various ways, Agatha has been a character that has helped teach Wanda how to use her magic beyond her natural ability to grasp a chaos magic. Hmm. I can't tell if I'm rooting that for I'm rooting for that to happen because I like Catherine Hahn so much or because the story thus far has planted the seeds to support it. I mean, certainly that final shot didn't make her look like a good guy. But I, my, my hunch is that maybe now that she knows what she's dealing with, she'll approach investigating it a little differently. OK. OK. Uh, also, I find really fascinating okay so obviously we're going to talk about the vision thing and i guess i'll just fast forward to that because not only you know white gray vision whoa yeah we like it that's from the comics and a lot of people maybe thought it might go that way what, uh, what does that mean 
it's like vision stripped of all his visionness. It's just okay. the it's form without the mind. Okay. <laughs> Which is heartbreaking, of course, for Wanda when her love no longer loves her in return. Um, mm. Or doesn't even know who the fuck she is. But uh, what I wanted to say about that, that I think is so interesting and a real demonstration of Wanda's powers as they're represented in the show, as if her literally like rage shouting out a whole world didn't prove it. But I was thinking about something in a previous episode where Darcy said that the, whatever his name is, Mr. McBad, uh, Mr. McSword bad, was uh, it's the H word that I'll always is it hey is it Hayward is it Hawthorne I think it's it's Hayward yeah um, I think I keep saying Hawthorne because of uh, Stranger Things oh that makes sense um but she, Darcy mentioned that Hayward was tracking Vision through his vibranium signature which means that like Wanda created. Vibranium, like a vibranium vision. That's like so powerful. It's also Hawkins and Stranger Things. So now I have another name to confuse in all of this. So I'm just going to use all these H names interchangeably, apparently. But I think I think in that vision scenario, I'm like saddest for uh, for Paul Bettany because he's been so charming. So to watch him have to play that and be being stripped of all of that, uh, you know, that personality and sensitivity and warmth is going to be upsetting to me. But I guess that that serves the show well. Yeah, Fair. Uh, I really will just bang this drum every episode. Please don't get rid of vision after this. Just please don't do it. I don't, I, whatever version you keep around, I would like some of Vision's storyline to continue because as much as I like WandaVision and what they've done, it has been Wanda's show. And mm -hmm. I still don't think that Vision has been done justice in the end. Oh season. no, because you know, like Vision has his moments in the shows, but he is, he's primarily serving Wanda's experience right now. Mm -hmm. If, if Vision stays in this form through the end of the next episode, do you have any like theories or predictions as to how he could be incorporated in the MCU after? Oh, sure. I mean, like the, the visionless vision isn't inherently evil. Um, he may be implemented that mm -hmm. way as an antagonist, but it's, you know, that character can go on to have its own life and relearn who it is, but it's not. It's like Groot, <laughs> like it's a new one. Is it, so it'd be, it'd be more like uh, like Vision starting as a blank slate, starting from scratch and regrowing a personality from there. Not not to the point that, that this version of Vision can't have that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. There's still a lot of questions to be about what exactly did Wanda create in this new Vision? Again, like creating vibranium is no small thing. Um, Obviously he can't exist outside the hex, but does that mean no part of him can continue? Like what, what is this that she's created? Well, and, and also like soul and independent uh, persona. And also the, just the nature of crossing the hex. We've already, you know, discussed how that can change, change who and what you are and what you're capable of. Oh my, there's, and like, now that I'm thinking about that, thinking that we didn't get Tiana Paris in this episode, there, there's just so many things that need to be re resolved in one more episode. I'm worried. They don't. They don't. It's a, it's a whole franchise and it all connects. It doesn't have to like all be like neatly tied up with a bow on top at the end of this. It doesn't, but I would certainly hope that WandaVision would have an ending that allows it to stand on its own. I suspect, I suspect that it, I suspect that it will, but I, I think it's just, it's Wanda ending in a negative place. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, there's no, I mean, so like, I guess the big theory is that Dr. Strange is going to show up and be like, yeah, this can't happen. I'm going to undo all your shit. Um, no, I can see that. Well, and, uh, wait, wait. And, and basically just like erase everything that happened. Well, not from her perspective, but like you, I'm taking away your toys basically because you're fucking up the whole universe. So like getting rid of Vision and her kids essentially is the emotional damage there. But hmm. that's 
that's just the pervasive theory and lord knows those haven't been correct ever so let's see all right i feel better then yeah <laughs> all right his job in the universe is That's to true. be like, this magic is fucked. I won't allow it. I'm so, I'm like, I'm so stressed about this. Like now I'm doing like a laundry list of things that he can take away. And just thinking about how that's going to impact everybody else that we've met in the story. I'm like, but wait, because like, I wouldn't want to be in a situation where even the supporting characters have to start over from, you know, square one. Cause some of them are mighty important too. I suppose he could erase it from ever happening, but I suspect that won't be what happens. All right. Yeah. I, I hope that's not the case. <laughs> any other, any other big things about episode eight before we close out this episode and eagerly await the season finale? I know I'm not prepared. It, it better be long. That's what I'll say. I have a good feeling it will be. I, th I think if I were to make a prediction, <laughs> I, I probably shouldn't say this because all my predictions turn out to be wrong. I think it's going to be even longer than this week's episode. I I feel like it has to be. There's too much to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, how do you wrap up Monica and Wanda at 40 minutes? I mean, and like, it only felt like we were kind of scratching the surface of what Darcy was up to too. Oh yeah. Darcy. I love Darcy. I'm glad. I believe that um, Kat Dennings has said she's coming back. So I'm glad. To hear that. Yeah. The more, the more of her, the better. But there, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot going on right now, and I want a certain amount of answers. But I know you can only accomplish so much, and and you know, accomplish accomplish them to the point that you've you've justified setting this stuff up to begin with in just one more episode. Yeah, yeah, one more episode. That's really freaking me out. Yeah, um, but I'm excited. I, I will. I guess if I have to single out one more thing, it would be the. Uh, the deed to the house with the note from Vision was pretty yes. fucking devastating. I can't believe I uh, I didn't even bring that up yet. <laughs> Ow. That, I mean, that's a, and that was like another thing that I think became exponentially more powerful because of her performance. Oh, yeah. It all Very comes down to that dang performance. Seriously. Emmy for Elizabeth Olsen. Ooh, I'll, I'll, ju I'll jump on board that campaign. <laughs> All right. That's it, guys. That is your edition of The Witching Hour. We'll be talking about that finale quite a bit next week. I'm warning you in advance. We basically turned this into an unofficial WandaVision recap show, and I'm happy about it. It's kind of exciting that that happened because I, I, like, I genuinely think it's more exciting that that happened naturally because we were so passionate and excited. And, and it's been such a thrill talking about all the little details and theorizing rather than having planned like, oh, when the next big Marvel thing comes out, we're going to fashion a whole show around. Like something about it felt so organic, natural and pure. And I think that's made the conversation even better. Agreed. And I look forward to it every week. Me too. Already looking forward to next week. As am I. <laughs> While everyone needs to pass the time until the next episode of WandaVision and Witching Hour, what would you recommend that they check out online? Um, me. Yeah, that, that, that was what I was going for. <laughs> yeah, you can find me at Haley Fouch on Twitter, at Haystack McGroovy on Instagram, and always uh, writing about new stream and stuff on Collider. Good shit. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff, and I will tease the next episode of Collider Ladies Night, which is dropping on March 5th. It is with Robin Wright. That is super cool. I still can't believe that happened, so go give that a watch when it's available. And with that, you have officially survived the witching hour. 